So just uh, welcome everyone to our little series of our Yale Repronym training activities. Uh, we had a nice starting day yesterday with JB in uh, statistical reproducibility topics and uh, Dorota and Pierre on containers and Adina and Yarek on data lad. Today, you know, sort of all linked data, all semantic, all annotation in our two presentations uh, interspersed with uh, me doing a talk at 11.30 or so. So anyway, for now, I will turn the floor over to Sebastian for his presentation on linked data and the semantic web. Yeah, thanks. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Sebastian. I, uh, If I had a physical office, I would be working at the Montreal Neurological Institute. I am a member of uh, Jamie Pauline's team. And so, the purpose of this talk today is to give you um, just like the core basics in terms of concepts and terminology of linked data and the semantic web. Um, and so the, the goal for my presentation would be that once you're starting to hear about um, the neuroimaging data model, you have some idea of what this, this stuff at the bottom means essentially. So I, I wanna get you to, to this level. Okay, so um, let's step back uh, for a moment and let's consider where we are. Uh, let's assume maybe you are an enthusiastic graduate student and you come into a new lab and you have some questions. And these questions might look like, for example, where do I find very specific kinds of data? And with specific, I mean, maybe you don't only care about uh, the cohort, but also some of the properties of that data. Um, and so that's, that's not an easy question to answer. And then similarly, maybe somebody who has already left the lab has done an analysis and you wonder how did they come up with these beautiful figures and there isn't really much to go on. So that's also a difficult question to answer. And let's also assume now that you have two choices. You could either ask one of your busy lab mates or you could ask a machine or let's say in general a computer or search engine. Well, most likely at the moment you would choose to ask your lab mate because the machine would probably not understand these questions. And so um, the purpose of the, the NIDM model and also of, of these technologies that I'm showing you is, is essentially to, to, to make the machine understand these questions. That's, I think, the big picture. Okay, so let's take another step back. Let's assume that we are now a grad student uh, in the late 1980s and we have one of these beautiful computers. And so if we're, if we're searching for information, if we want to look at information, then what we're usually doing is uh, we're connecting through some protocol with uh, a large computer or ma mainframe computer. Um, and then on this computer, we need to list the directory and find a specific file and read that file. And then maybe in this file, it says, well, there is another file, on another computer. So then we manually log in with a password, go to the other computer and look at this other file. So the problem here, and if, if you're using things like SSH or, or these, these connection protocols, you, 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 you still know this, this kind of use case. The problem here is that documents are siloed to the physical machines that they're located on, right? So, so it makes a difference to you as a user whether a document is a com on computer A or computer B. And um, so in the... Uh, uh, late 80s, early 90s, um, there was this man, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, who said, well, let's not do this anymore. Let's not send people and look at uh, individual files on individual computers. Let's abstract this away. And so what we're looking at here is the proposal for uh, the World Wide Web. And the way that this abstraction is, uh, is, is made possible is that you have an interface now that's called your web browser. This is a really old web browser here. And you now link between these documents with something called hyperlinks. And so now you don't really care anymore where your documents are. They are on some machine, but really the only thing you use is the link that takes you to another document. So um, we're now broken out of the, of the document silos, so to say. And now we step forward a little bit. Um, the web is very successful and people have readily adopted it. And um, one of the things that people want to do with the web is they want to create content. And this has been in the design from the start, but let's say that there was uh, an emergence of these services, um, what we typically call Web 2.0 now, 
And so all of these services are in some way interactive and they allow you to create information. Um, but again, the problem here is now it makes a difference where your information is located with respect to the service, right? So if we think um, in terms of information, now we have information silos. And if we look at a simple example, we could say, well, um, maybe Ernie and Barrett are two people and they have a MySpace profile, you know, been around for a while. And uh, they also have a Facebook profile. And on the MySpace profile, they're friends. And on the Facebook profile, they're not friends. So what if you now ask a question like, are Ernie and Barrett friends? Or maybe more generally, list all the friends of Ernie, right? It depends now on whether you ask in a MySpace context or if you ask in a Facebook context. But the thing here is that the real entities of Ernie and Barrett really have a friendship relationship. And that is something that exists in the world. We just don't have it independently of the, of the service platform. And so again, here we have Tim Berners-Lee come up and say, well, you know what, maybe uh, we shouldn't do this anymore. We shouldn't think of facts as things that live on specific computers or documents. Um, uh, sorry, <laughs> on specific documents, we should just link the facts. So in a similar sense to the documents, we want to break out of the information silo now by linking facts within documents. So we no longer care where the information is stored. And if we think about the example here, then we have this fact, Ernie is a friend of Bert. And now both Facebook and MySpace would have some way of linking up with this fact that is stored in a way uh, centrally accessible. And then whatever they're doing with this information to present it is done probably by a machine. So the problem is now, how does the machine understand the fact Ernie is a friend of Bert? So the goal is make the meaning of facts or make the semantics uh, machine readable. Okay, and so this is how we get to the resource description framework. This this was kind of the proposal for for linked or semantic data. Um, so when we think about the world in a in the RDF framework, uh, resource description framework, we might think uh, we might say something like, "Well, the world consists of everything. Everything is a resource, right? This is how we think of the world." And then resources can either be things, or they can be links and relationships between things. So we have things and relationships between things. And so specifically in our world, in our model of the world, we uh, consider that all facts can be stated in this subject predicate object sense. And because these are three elements, uh, we call these RDF triples. So a subject is a thing, object is a thing, a predicate uh, is a relationship. And so in that sense, when we think about RDF, um, we can look at our facts and say, well, Ernie is a thing, is a friend of, is a relationship, and Bert is another thing. And so RDF is, is a data model, right? It's is a way to model things and uh, facts about the world. And if we now look at this in a subject predicate object sense, um, so we say uh, Ernie is subject of the statement, uh, is a friend of, is a predicate, and uh, Bert is an object, then we, we, we have modeled the information, but, but a machine might still, you know, not understand it. And specifically, one question is, well, who is Ernie, right? There might be many Ernies in the world. Um, so one way, one part of the RDF specification is that uh, resources are dereferenceable. And that's just a fancy way of saying that the name of a resource is a link. Right, so we use a very general sense of link here. Uh, it, that's the uh, international resource identifier, which is basically a link that can have um, Unicode text. But I mean, let, let's just say it's a link, right? So, um, so we can we can uh, know for sure that there is a unique identification for the thing Ernie that is identified with a link that we create, and so. Um, for example, we could use something like this. This is a link to a resource um, on the DBpedia. I'm going to show you DBpedia a little bit later. Um, and now we have a specific link. And then the, the criteria for uh, RDF are that subjects and predicates need to be uh, um, links. They need to be uniquely identifiable. And then objects, you can, you can have cases where you, we don't want to uh, be very specific. You can say, OK, well, the name of the object that, that somebody is a friend of is just Bert. And we don't, we don't really specify that. And you could also put an IRI and specify the specific entity that is 
uh, a friend of Ernie. Okay, and then the machine might still have some other questions. For example, well, what does it mean to be an Ernie? Or what does it mean to be a friend, right? And, and this um, is something that we solve with vocabulary. So in, in, in a very general sense, vocabularies are agreements about the meaning of terms, right? So we, we have, uh, we associate meaning with, with, with a statement like, is a friend of? And so in, in the RDF world, um, these are also things that we can dereference, we can click on. And so we, what we would do in this case here is we would look for an existing vocabulary. And um, there are many on the internet and we're gonna take a quick look at them uh, later. So for example, a close match to is a friend of might be from the uh, friend of a friend vocabulary, the, the, the term knows, right? And so if I, if I click on this, um, I mean, I can, I can actually do that, right? Then, then I can see, okay, well, there is, uh, there is some kind of description what it means to, uh, to be a friend of someone. Okay, and then uh, what does it mean to be an Ernie? Well, again, um, there is a vocabulary here. This is a DBpedia uh, vocabulary. And uh, we, can, we can look at the class of a fictional character, which Ernie is a fictional character. So if you go back to our, um, I'm oh, sorry, yeah. So, so the takeaway message here is vocabularies give meaning uh, and, and also structure. And uh, so if you go back to our, our graph, um, what does it mean to be an Ernie? Well, it means that Ernie is a fictional character and we can look at each of these uh, elements here and um, understand their meaning, right? And then what does it mean to be a friend of someone? Well, we have now specified friend in a, in a unique dereferenceable way. And some other statement in the world uh, where somebody is also a friend of somebody else might use the same term. And then we know, okay, well, they have the same relationship, even though they're different entities. Okay. Um, so this is a pretty lengthy way of writing things, right? And, and the goal of this is not to be read by, by humans necessarily, but, but by machines. And um, it's still a nice, uh, it would still be a nice goal that the, the human can read these texts. And so the question is, how do we, how do we serialize? What are file formats essentially for this type of information? And uh, for RDF, there are uh, several serializations that are commonly used. Um, what we've been looking at so far, where you just print out the entire link to an entity or property is, is typically called an N triple. Um, there are other uh, serializations like RDF XML, and uh, I'm just going to show you the, the turtle serialization. So that stands for terse RDF triple language. And that is a nice way of um, showing complex graphs and text format in a way that they're still readable for, for humans. Um, so let's look at the statement that we just saw as a graph. Um, so what's going on here? We have, in the beginning, we, we essentially we don't want to write these, um, these links every time. So we create prefixes and prefixes are essentially local variables, right? So we say RDF really means this entire string uh, or link. And now if we, if we say something like RDF type, we know that this is really this link. And then here we add type. And so this would be something that's dereferenceable. We could look at what RDF type means. And similarly here, rather than writing the entire uh, DB ontology link, we could say, well, DBO is fictional character um, and so on. Okay, and uh, an interesting uh, thing to note here is that if, if you if you have, uh, for example, foth knows, so this is the, the friend statement here, um, then there can be uh, lists of things. So here is there's only one entry, um, but so dbr bert is um, this entity here, and we can we can reference it uh, as a knows property, and then we can also say some things about what dbr bird means. Um, okay. So uh, now this entire talk is called link data, and you might wonder, well, how does this turn into link data, right? Well, um, RDF triples, and we've already seen a simple graph, but RDF triples are can be represented as graphs, or we can think of them as graphs, as directed graphs. And uh, so, for example, if we have these statements here, so we have a lot of statements about Bob, right? So Bob is a friend of somebody, and he's interested in Mona Lisa, and he was born on a certain day, and he's a person. Um, well, 
the Mona Lisa in the last statement here is the object, but the Mona Lisa can also be the subject of another uh, statement, RDF statement. And this is how you can link graphs together. So if you, for example, now have a statement about the Mona Lisa, say, well, the Mona Lisa was created by Leonardo da Vinci. Well, now you have linked information. You can see that Bob is interested in something and you have other information about that something. For example, you get to Leonardo da Vinci. Um, all right, so this is, this is how we get linked data. Um, now let's take one step back and look at uh, our uh, RDF uh, uh, turtle syntax again of the statement that we looked at before. And, and remember that we said, well, vocabularies give meaning and structure, right? So well, what does this actually mean? Let's say we, we want to know what um, DBO fictional character means. Um, well, so we can click on this and now we are landing in the DBpedia. The DBpedia is, is uh, a graph um, uh, database that stores information about things that are described in the Wikipedia. And right? it's, it's, it's a pretty big um, database. So we can see now that uh, fictional character um, has a type. It's, it's, it's a class instance uh, of the uh, our web ontology language. Um, we can see that uh, fictional characters are a subclass of something else, right? So there's, there's some hierarchy in here. There's a subclass of an agent. So if you click on agent, you can then see that an agent is a subclass of a thing. And so a thing is just, that's the root of the world, right? Nothing, nothing is a superset of things. Everything is a thing. So, so we, can, we can see that there is some, some structure to these statements um, that we're looking at. And the way we do this is with a vocabulary. So again, if we go back here, um, then if we look at fictional character, well, the vocabulary here is the DBpedia ontology, right? And so the DBpedia ontology contains these, this information about what is, uh, what does it mean to be a fictional character, but also how does a fictional character relate to other things in the world, for example, agents. Um, and there is this, this sub, subclass uh, hierarchy here. Well, how do people make these vocabularies, right? Um, well, that um, RDF is not only a data model, but is also a very limited vocabulary. And so, um, if if you if you look at these, um, if you look at uh, this link here, you will you will get a text file where essentially a number of very uh, limited um, terms are defined. And so, specifically here, uh, we have some statements about. Uh, resources, classes, and then there are properties. So if, if, if you use RDF type, it means that some entity can be uh, of a certain type and that being of a certain type is a property, but you can already see that this is not enough to define somebody as a friend of somebody else. Um, so there is, excuse me, uh, there is also the RDF schema um, that adds a number of other contract constructs with the goal of uh, allowing people to build vocabularies, right? And so specifically the things that we're adding with RDF schema is this subclass relationship. So you can have hierarchies of classes and also a uh, sub property. And then the other interesting thing here, and I'm not going to go into too much detail, but um, it's, uh, we, we add domain and ranges to properties. Now, the reason that this is interesting, um, let me show you uh, a little example that I took of, of a course um, from the uh, Cultural Institute of Technology about this. Um, so let's say that the property discovered by, so we, we, we're talking about greenhouse gas effect, and that was discovered by somebody. Uh, so, if we read it. so let's say discovered by has a uh, domain and a range. Well, what this means in practice is that you can say, uh, only uh, persons can be discoverer of something. And maybe, maybe you want to, to, to frame this more generally, um, but what this allows you to do is if you have greenhouse gas effect and then you have, this was discovered by somebody and you don't know, let's say you don't know this, this side of the graph here, well, you can make certain assumptions about um, what, what kind of thing Joseph Rie might be, for example, a person because the, the relationship discovered by can only uh, have uh, persons as its, um, as its object. 
The other thing that you can do with the subclass of hierarchy here is you can you can also um, make uh, uh, other conclusions about your data, even though they might not be explicitly given here. So for example, you could say, well, if Joseph Fourier is a physicist and physicist is a subclass of a scientist, then he is also a scientist, right? And, and so this is just a, a quick example to show you how, uh, how we can get uh, structure through vocabularies and these uh, RDF schema images. And, and again, well, the vocabulary that we're using here, DBO is a DB, uh, DBpedia ontology, and uh, there are other vocabularies. So we, we, we could look at the, uh, any of the fictional character again. We've already done that. So in this case, we're just going to continue here. So, um, well, there are many um, vocabularies. Um, and uh, a lot of them are, have also been around for a long time. So uh, some of the more um, well-known vocabularies, I guess. Uh, so there's a Dublin core, which interestingly is from Dublin, Ohio. So it's not uh, an Irish vocabulary. And, and, and so the, the scope or the, what, what, what the terms um, defined in the Dublin core are trying to, to model are uh, bibliographic resources and works of art, right? So there, there wouldn't be, uh, let's say, terms about medical diagnoses, right? That's that's out of the scope of this vocabulary. And then, so friend of a friend, that is, um, is a very common vocabulary for persons and relationships between persons. So we've already seen this. We used it to uh, specify that somebody knows somebody, or you know, in a very general sense, could be a friend of somebody else. Um, and again, I mean, I don't know if you've already looked at this, but uh, you can click on this and you can you can look at the specific uh, at the specific definitions within these uh, within these vocabularies. And then, uh, the, yeah. Question there. Um, so then, so again, all these links are great. The links are machine readable and machine followable and searchable and great. But eventually you get to the end of something that ends up in what looked an awful lot like human readable text. And that prior slide you had of the what knows means is full of all mm -hmm. sorts of subtle semantic-y things that yeah, when you and I read it, we know what it means, but we eventually stop being machine readable at some point. Is that in general correct? Or is there ways that even that was structured in a way that is even more usable than that page. Um, sense, yeah, no, I, that makes sense. I don't know if I have, uh, if I know the answer to that. So the, what, what, what so um, I guess what you're asking is, for example, if, 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 if there are like labels or descriptions that aren't themselves dereferenceable, uh, are there ways to make that information also machine readable? Is, is, is that what you're saying? Or, or or just uh, in my mind, just trying to make sure I know that eventually the machine readability stops at some border of the universe of you know, uh, yeah, I, I mean, knowledge. And then I, I guess I want to caveat this with um, my level of experience. So I'm not a I'm not a linked data expert. I have, I'm uh, learning this myself. But but I think I think the goal here eventually is that that some human facing service is going to consume this information and and so i don't know exactly where the boundary is i have a little example about the, the google knowledge graph um so that is something that you can use in, uh, in 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 search queries uh and then i'm i'm assuming that well at, at some point you have information that that you read uh, uh as a human and and and, and consume in that way um but, but there are pretty pretty complex uh, semantic queries you can do, and I'm, I have a little example um, later on for for these graph statements. Yeah, I don't I don't know if this answers your question. Yeah, no, good enough for now. Carry on. Okay, great. Well, maybe you have a better answer actually. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Okay. Um, right, and so the last one I, I wanted the last vocabulary I wanted to show you because you you might come across this, and and this is also a little bit where. Where the current excitement is coming from uh, is, is, is uh, things like like the schema.org uh, vocabulary, and so that is a vocabulary that is maintained by by big search engine providers uh, to create things like knowledge graphs. And so um, I'm going to show you in a second what that means. Let's 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 take a quick look at the Dublin uh, Dublin Core vocabulary. So you can see here that we have. Um, we have a number of classes defined in there. Um, we also have a number of properties that 
things can have. And so if we um, if we click on one of them, right, and we say, okay, well, let me let me see some of the the, the properties. Uh, you, you you can again uh, scroll through them and uh, and and find out more about uh, what 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 it means to be, for example, uh, to be the audience of something, right? Um, so uh, here's the the schema.org overview, and I'm I'm actually going to to click on this uh, to show you. So for example, uh, information that you can model with with uh, with with uh, schema.org, you could say, well, you have a creative work, and let's say um, maybe somebody wants to file a uh, license claim against some music you're using in a video. Um, I guess you could you could use music composition, for example, and then you, you can see that that there are certain properties that music composition can have. So, for example, I can have a composer, and that has an expected type, and so on. So, what is the purpose of all this? Why would you why would you do this? What are the application cases for schema.org? Well, you probably have already seen this work in practice, and because it is meant to be machine readable, you might not be faced with schema.org itself. But the thing that um, that this type of linked data allows you uh, to provide to a user or or somebody who uses Google, for example, are these uh, these linked data representations, and this is essentially information about Marie Curie that is taken from the Google Knowledge Graph and encoded, excuse me, uh, in, for example, uh, schema.org vocabulary. And uh, you, 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 may, you may see uh, other versions of this. For example, if you search for a recipe, you have, uh, you, have, you have some semantic information in your search results if you use Google. Um, right. So. The interesting thing here is we've looked at all these vocabularies, and uh, you might you might wonder, well, somebody has defined person-to-person -person relationships, somebody has defined bibliographic information, somebody has defined these these more search engine-oriented vocabularies. But uh, you know, like, what if I need several of them? Right? Do, do I need to create a new vocabulary? And the answer to this is no, and that is the beauty of this uh, this this approach, because the vocabularies themselves are linked. And um, so what, what this means is that there are statements that you can make about some of the, uh, uh, the terms defined in these vocabularies that establish relationships to terms defined in other, in other vocabularies. So you could say something like, it's the same as, or uh, it's related to, or it is about something. And then the object of this statement is a term in another vocabulary. So if you, if you look at, um, for example, this uh, linked open vocabularies overview, you can see that some of the ones that, that I've already shown you, like FOF and uh, schema, are here. And if you click on one, you get this, this nice interactive view. And, and you, you can see all of the relationships that FOF has. And you can, you can dig into this and, and, and explore it. But essentially, uh, what this means is that you can, uh, you can define a vocabulary that makes use of existing vocabularies and just adds a little scope of it, uh, and and then still have statements that are understandable um, and and can link to statements that have been made with with this other vocabulary. And this is how you get this this big linked data ecosystem. Okay, so let's have a short recap. So what what how do you make RDF information? Well, there's this, this figure that, that you often see um, on the internet about this. So that there's essentially like a layer cake system here. And so uh, RDF, the data model, is what I've, what I've shown you in the beginning. And then uh, it makes use of these really core web technology things like uh, URIs or uh, URLs. Um, so, so uh, uniform uh, resource identifiers or international resource identifiers, and, and also uh, these this, uh, HTTP transfer protocols, um, and to to, to dereference de these statements, and then you have these uh, serializations, which is essentially a way of how do you write down these graph uh, RDF triple statements in a way that a machine can read them, and, and maybe a human can read them, um, and then. On top of this, we have uh, a number of um, 
model languages essentially allow us to to build models uh, of, of of the world or, or create these vocabularies and and this is something that confused me a little bit when I when I started learning about this there's kind of a sliding scale between two terms that are both used in, in uh, connection with linked data as vocabularies and ontologies and so uh, essentially they live on a, on a kind of a sliding scale where you have voc vocabularies are relatively uh, limited in their in their uh, in their modeling and it is mostly uh, a controlled vocabulary of terms and then ontologies can be very complex and have very specific statements about uh, mutual exclusivity of certain properties and so on but, but, but in general there's the, the similar things there are ways to describe things that exist in the world uh, with this core RDF um, framework and so uh one of the nice things that you can do when you when you zoom out a little bit here is uh well there are additional ways of using this uh this this uh, rdf layer cake and, and and a really interesting one is is to query so um specifically uh you can you can make use of the fact that that all of these uh, linked rdf triples exist uh somewhere somebody somebody is hosting them and now you can you can ask questions like for example the one that i showed you in the beginning about very detailed uh properties of of data or information and i have prepared a little example here so um oh i'm sorry the the, the thing that i wanted to tell you is that the, the language in which you query link data uh information is called sparkle um and so uh, this is this is an example sparkle statement and uh, you you will recognize this aspect here from from the turtle syntax so we can we define our prefix here and then uh, we, we 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 now run a query and we we write the query essentially like we write the uh, rdf triples right so we say well there exists some character we, we put we say character is a variable and, and this character we expect to be of type fictional character. And then this character, so, so if, we, if we do the semicolon, we don't have to write character again. That's a little syntax trick here. Um, so this character also has another property. It's called series from the DBP ontology. And so the, this character is part of the series. And we put this in another variable called series. And then this character has a third property um, somebody is portraying that character. We put this in, a, in another uh, variable for voice actor, we're calling it, because you see where I'm going with this, but we're going to look at voice actors of, of, of uh, Sesame Street characters. Uh, and then maybe they have a nationality, right? Um, even though they're fictional characters, they could have a nationality. And at the end, we have a filter statement. And um, OK, so that's, that's, that's essentially that. Um, well, if we go to the DBpedia Sparkle endpoint, so this is this is essentially a way for us to, to query DBpedia, uh, and then we put put this little um, query in here that I have prepared, and we run execute. Then what we get is an overview of um, of the the characters that are uh, characters of the um, Sesame Street uh, TV series. So if I, if I click on Kermit the Frog, yeah, sometimes this doesn't work that well. Uh, if I click on uh, Kermit the Frog, you will see somewhere here um, that it is part of uh, part of the Sesame Street, right? And then I can also see that Kermit is an American fictional character, and he was voiced by by two different uh, voice actors, um, and then. Here we can see that Count from Count is actually not an American character. It's the exception here is from Romania. Um, so I mean, this is a toy example, obviously. But the, but the, the nice thing is that theoretically we could now link up with the information, for example, about the United States, right? And we could say, okay, well, um, let's say we only want to see characters uh, that are on Sesame Street but have. Uh, are from a country in Europe, right? And then, and then maybe we would only find count from count because if we go into Romania, then um, somewhere in here there is probably a link to um, 
uh, Europe as a concept. And then uh, we, we, we can do these really complicated queries here. Or we could go and look deeper into the uh, individual um, voice actors here. And, and for example, filter, we only want to see uh, Sesame Street characters that were voiced by somebody born before 1970. And that, that is not something that is very easy to type in just a regular Google search. Um, but, but you can very explicitly um, define a, a query like this in, in Sparkle using LinkedIn. OK, so this is an application case, very simple one. You can be very complex here, obviously. Um, so if we're thinking about our, our original two use cases, well, what are we missing here? Well, one thing we're missing um, is this provenance thing because so far we haven't really talked about time as uh or, or you know an order of things uh as as part of this rdf data model because the rdf data model is very simple and it, it's by its definition a temporal and we want to model things that happen to data or other documents or information um but uh we can do this as most things are, are able to be solved uh, in, in, in the RDF world with specific vocabularies. So this is actually from the uh, RDF um, documentation. It says, well, if you want to model uh, temporal events, you can, you can create a new vocabulary. And that's, this is precisely what has been done um, with the uh, W3C prof model. And so W3C, by the way, stands for the uh, consortium that is creating specifications for the World Wide Web. So there's three W's, that's why it's W3C. And, and uh, so W3C prof is both a data model. So it's, it's a way of thinking about the world again. Um, and the way we think about the world is that there are entities and there are agents and there are activities. I'm going to show you in a second what that means. And in this prof, uh, under this prof umbrella, there's also vocabulary, right? So, so the name entity is part of a, a vocabulary, and then properties that can exist between these uh, elements here, um, like was generated by, are also part of the prof uh, O vocabulary. And the reason it's O, by the way, is because it's it's called a prof ontology. So you can already see that there's conceptual similarity here between vocabulary and ontologies. And if you if you want to read more about it, you can you can click on this and read a bit about it. But but I'm just going to summarize it for you very briefly in a in a simple little example. So um, let's say we have we have our model here, and we have a situation like this. So somebody has created a thing, um, and then uh, so this is a statement. It says I made this right, and um, well then maybe eventually somebody else is, is creating another statement and says well no I made this right. And, and, and if you model if, if you model these statements in a, in a, in a, in a prof data model, um, well, what does it mean um, to be uh, an, an entity? Well, yeah, let, let, let's first break down what it means to be uh, to be an, an entity or an agent, right? So, so entities are things that can have provenance. So, so for example, documents or uh, yeah, uh, any, anything basically that, 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 that can be created. Uh, and they are created by activities. So activities could either be write a document or create this ball of yarn with needles, uh, or it could be change it. So maybe a newspaper article uh, can have provenance in the sense that somebody has written it and then they have revised it. Um, and the revision process would be an activity. And then agents are entities, and again, very general sense, that take responsibility for activities. So in this sense, it would be, an activity has been done to either create or alter an entity and the person or, or the, the agent with at least some responsibility for this uh, uh, is, is also defined. So, so if, we, if, we, if we model it in this way, then here we could say, well, this is not, uh, this is not an accurate statement because this, um, this entity here has, has been created by an activity uh, from another agent. So this is not the agent that created this uh, activity. Okay, so what, what, what is a practical use case of this? Well, um, there is, uh, for example, in the UK, uh, a official public record called the Gazette, and it's, it's been around for a long time. So this is uh, um, from 1666, and they here are writing about the sad occasion of the big London fire. 
But the interesting thing is that um, for this type of data, we have linked data records. And so, for example, if, if you were curious about um, uh, awards being conferred in the, in the United Kingdom, um, you might, you know, maybe you're interested, let's say, in, I think, uh, Order of the British Empire is something that scientists can, can be uh, conferred. Uh, can, can be conferred upon scientists. So let's say that there is um, update our results. Okay, so 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 some statement here from 12th of March. We can click on this, and then um, yeah, somebody has was made a member of the British Empire. Uh, well, there is a link data view for this, right? And so we can see some things about this the statement, and and, and this is of a certain type. But the interesting thing here is that it has provenance. And so what this means is that the statement itself um, about this thing that occurred in the world, somebody was made member of the British Empire, um, has provenance. And so if we click on the provenance, then we can see, you know, this uh, something has happened uh, and was done by an agent and this agent did a activity and the activity was done to an entity, which in this case is the document we just looked at. So that is a use case um, for linked data. Um, and another use case for linked data or provenance of data is obviously uh, the, the neuroimaging um, use case that I've, I've, I've given uh, in, in the beginning. So what do we need to make this happen? We have, we have RDF, we have linked data principle or technologies. We have now the W3C prof model. Um, well, we will need uh, a vocabulary about neuroimaging things because none of the vocabulary that I've shown you so far uh, have a term for fMRI, right? or even MRI, or or even even something like like ASD as a as a, as a clinical diagnosis. This is not modeled or or described in these vocabularies. So we, we need to either find one, or if there isn't one, create one ourselves. And this is exactly what uh, uh, NIDM does, right? Um, so essentially, um, if we if we go back to this layer layer cake of the NIDM world that I showed you in the beginning, you can you can maybe now this makes more sense, right? We're building on top of semantic web technology, so specifically RDF and also Sparkle as a query language, and then we're building on Prof as a as a model to describe provenance, um, excuse me, uh, for, for data sets. And the reason that we want to have provenance of data sets is, is to, for example, solve a question like uh, what was done and by whom to arrive at specific results that are now published in, 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 in some journal article. Um, so we have a vocabulary. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you to you or a, a short overview of it in a second. Um, and we have linked data principles to solve these use cases. So for example, uh, an IDM vocabulary could be something like this, um, similar to what we've seen in, uh, in the schema.org case or in the, in the uh, Dublin core case. So you have, you have certain classes defined here and then you have properties defined. You can, you can see already that they're, uh, they have these, I guess, human readable descriptions, um, but the, there are also these, these relationships. So is A here, for example, would say that NIDM head of my design is of type uh, OWL. So OWL is a vocabulary if you've seen before, it's the uh, web ontology language. Uh, it's an object property and, and, and so on. So now you can use this to um, describe facts about neuroimaging. And the other thing you need is a data model, right? So, so is, is a way of, of thinking about um, how, what aspect of, of facts about the MRI world do you actually want to model? And, and so I'm not going to go into detail about this because I think there is going to be another talk, um, but that is essentially what you will be seeing uh, as, as kind of the implementation of these principles and the use of this vocabulary in these different data models that exist in the NIDM world. So there's the uh, data model for experiments um, or raw data essentially uh, 
and then for, for workflows that can happen to them and for the results. And this is the end of my talk. And I thank you very much for your time. That is fabulous. Thank you, Sebastian. There is a little bit of time for uh, some questioning if there are questions to be had. So I guess the other question I have while, while we're waiting for other questions. Um, so when you or the NIDM folks are faced with uh, this challenge of oh, adding everything, you know, neuroimaging, you know, you presumably have the opportunity to take advantage of, I don't know, uh, some analysis has been done by other you know, groups before that. So, I mean, maybe a workflow exists because of physicists have been using workflow and maybe some physicists wrote some ontology for that. So to some extent, as long as you can tag into something that already exists and hope that is well yeah. curated, it then takes care of linking it to all the other places it is related to. So you don't necessarily have to solve the whole web of those 10,000 different you know, ontologies you know, that might link to to yeah. your concept, okay. So exactly, and, and, and I think that is the great strength of this approach that uh, you specifically should not reinvent the wheel, um, but make liberal use of these existing uh, ontologies and, and vocabularies. Maybe something that is important to point out here, so if you, um, I, yeah, well, if you remember the slide where, where I showed you the, the links between vocabularies and how you can in this way make use of other vocabularies, um, if you're a user now, if, if, if we go back to this graduate student, um, you don't need to take care of this. It, let's say for the most part, right? You might, you might say, well, my study is, is talking about something that isn't actually part of the NIDM vocabulary. So I might want to add this term to it, but, but this is all taken care of. The thing that will require some thinking and, and, and user input is taking your existing data um, and the, the meta information that you either have in, in your head about this or that is written in some format on, on the disk and now annotating this information with these dereferenceable terms from, from the linked data world. And so this is, this is a step that is, um, I guess, human or, or manual to some extent. And, and is essentially part of a data curation process that, that we all do, but I guess is becoming more and more uh, the focus actually of, of what it means to, to create scientific output, to, to make your data itself uh, not only discoverable, but also understandable and reproducible and, and, and all of these things. So um, yeah, you definitely make use of other vocabularies um, but but in a in a design conceptual sense that this is something that let's say the NIDM initiative is taken care of you as a user will then have to uh, map your specific data to these vocabularies. Great, thanks. <clears throat> Other questions out there? Well, if people are being shy, I'll ask one more. And again, it may um, I don't want to steal the time from anyone else. Um, and it may be a question I'll have to ask uh, Dave also later, but um, so fine, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, you know, you have a concept of a, you know, end back, you know, a semantic memory, you know, uh, fMRI task. You go and have some tools that you know, tell you, okay, well, semantic memory has already been defined by a psychologist or, or someone, and you look at that. <laughs> um, and then you see, you know, they don't really describe it the way I really think of semantic memory a little bit different than that. Uh, so again, there must yeah. be some threshold of, okay, well, my version of semantic memory is this. And it's, it's, yeah, so it's, I don't know, is there anything you can say about, fine, you do that discovery, but then you run into quibbles with things and I don't know. Yeah, so so I guess that that is really an important point. And I guess that should, should be pointed out that this step of mapping into existing ontologies of vocabularies is not an easy one, especially in a scientific context where you know we, we don't do, always do the same thing over and over. Things change and there are specific adaptations. So, so this is this is an actual design problem. Um, what do you do when things are similar but not exactly the same? So um, you can you can think about this uh, maybe. I think how, how NIDM does this is, is, is there's this concept of common data elements or common terms, so to say. So th these are things that uh, that are 
well defined and and that are used over and over by by many um, uh, researchers, let's say magnetic resonance imaging, there isn't maybe a lot of uh, wiggle room to what it means to do to, to be magnetic resonance imaging. Um, but then there's also these personal data elements where maybe in your study, you have used an existing tool for which this common data element or common term exists, but you've adapted it. And now it's it's a different thing. It's, it isn't exactly the same. Um, and this, this is a challenge for sure. Um, th there are, I think, ways through this structure that you can have in uh, in, in in these uh, linked data concepts to still get back to a shared layer, right? So maybe there is a concept that both your variation of the tool and another variation of the tool both share and how they would be uh, rediscoverable. But um, yeah, I, I know that this is something that that is actively worked on, and I'm, I'm sure Dave will have a great answer for this. Yeah. And I think part of that answer might be you do what you can and get it right. get to the system. And that doesn't stop you then from using it and discovering things. And then that ontology, the, the knowledge part of it, you know, sort of always evolves. And so don't get too obsessed yeah. by that detail because you'll then have to solve whatever about that when your science cares about that solution, not encoding the data yeah. today. Okay. okay. Can I maybe say one, one, th one thing in that sort of like a, a direction uh, there's the obviously there's the problem of how do we annotate manually things, uh, uh, which is you know you know what what kind of tools and GUIs and you know uh, uh, libraries do we have for doing that? Uh, but there's a lot of situations where we can annotate automatically. Uh, let's say you process some data, uh, you know exactly what happened to the data. Those that information can be put in the graph without the user. Uh, like a uh, intervention at all, uh, so there's a they kind of like a, this. These two situations are kind of like you know and and uh, yeah different, right? I mean like a, uh, either there's a lot of a manual work or like a you know a GUI interface where you have to enter things and uh, choose uh, you know the terms and all those things, or or you or but you may also like you know, have that uh, bits uh, neuroimaging data set that you are processing through something that you know. And that has a, an IDM representation, link data representation that can go directly into the graph of things that we can search for. So uh, I just wanted to separate a little bit those two uh, uh, use cases. I mean, uh, yeah, thanks. Situation. Yeah, so if, I think, for example, in the NIDM results world, uh, there are um, connectors to commonly used analysis tools that generate this type of information for you in an automated way because what you're doing is, is very standardized for example you're using fsl to describe a, uh, a general linear model and then and run this analysis and then um, you, you can get the provenance and the description of, of the provenance of this data set generated for you and, and correctly annotated great i know we're coming up on the edge of our hour so uh i want to thank you again for this it's a great uh uh, set up that lets uh, our afternoon uh, details in the neuroimaging world you know, jump right off from a fabulous uh, basis. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Sebastian. And, thank you. And thanks all you out there in listener land, and we will uh, continue with various sessions uh, later on today.